On the name utilitarianism, I agree, it was a bit unfortunate because uh, it's not really as if utilitarians want to make things useful for their own sake or functional for their own sake. You know, the, the things that they're talking about are instrumental to something which is good in itself, which would be um, human happiness, which people are not so uh, ready to sneer at. So I think something like Henry Sidgwick's slightly longer phrase, universal benevolence, is a slightly better and more inf informative uh, name than utilitarianism. But I think we are stuck with it. Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. Today I will be talking about utilitarianism with Professor Roger Crisp. Roger Crisp is a fellow and tutor in philosophy at St Anne's College in Oxford. He currently holds the university post of Professor of Moral Philosophy and the Yahiro Fellow of Tutor in Philosophy. He works in ethics, um, moral philosophy, meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. He's the author of multiple works in the field, including the Roulette Philosophy Guidebook to Mill on Utilitarianism, which is the subject of today's discussion, as well as Virtue Ethics, Reasons and the Good, and the Oxford Handbook to the History of Ethics. In our discussion, we talked about the history of utilitarianism from Bentham to Mill, and we also give you our own opinions about the foundations of ethical theories, and towards the end we debate the usefulness of rule consequentialism. So, I really enjoyed this conversation. I certainly learned something from it. Professor Crisp was able to give me a distinction between two types of hedonism. I've always thought of myself as a hedonist, for better or for worse, uh, but Professor Crisp was able to make some distinctions there that helped me make sense of how I think about these things. I also think that for someone who is approaching this for the first time, we give a concise and accessible overview of the origins and history and main debates around utilitarianism. So this is exactly the sort of conversation I'm hoping to bring you with this podcast, one that is reasonably concise and accessible, but hopefully also really educational and informative. So I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. So without any further preamble, it is my absolute pleasure to bring you Professor Roger Cresp. Hi, I am here with Professor Roger Crisp from Oxford University. Professor, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk today about John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. And I've got a little bit of a hidden agenda, well, not so hidden as I'm telling you all, for this is most modern political philosophy, which is the subject of the podcast, at least insofar as, you know, Rawls, Nozak, the people you start with, begins by basically ruling utilitarianism out. We're not doing that. Given that we're not doing that, what are we doing? My goal here is actually to ask listeners to go back and look at this theory again with fresh eyes. There's certainly problems and challenges with it, which we're going to discuss, but my own personal view has always been that there's more to be said from some sort of mature rule-based consequentialism than people would generally let on. Let's just start, though, before we get into any of that. Professor, how do you see what you do these days? I've been rereading your utilitarianism book, but I know you've written about a lot of other stuff. How do you think about what you do and what you like to think about? Uh, I think maybe one uh, way to view what I'm doing is to see it as um, 
using the history of philosophy to try to uh, illuminate, try to help us answer uh, timeless questions in, in moral philosophy. So in itself, I'm not especially interested in what Aristotle thought or what Mill thought for its own sake. But I am interested in the questions that they were trying to answer about what makes life good for us or what the right thing to do is, what the right way to live is. And they have very interesting answers to that. Answers more interesting probably than I could come up with on my own. So I spend a lot of time reading philosophers of the past, but I, I don't forget the, uh, the questions that, that, that really motivate contemporary philosophy. Great. And that's definitely an attitude I'm approaching this interview with. So that's good to hear because you can just read them for their own sake, right? Like, why is this important in the development of history and so on? And then you can also read them, like you say, in terms of, is there something we can take from this in terms of what makes a valuable life? What, what, how do we want to live? What, what, these sorts of big questions, as it were. Let's jump in. Do you have a preliminary definition of utilitarianism to get us started with? Uh, I think there are really two components to standard utilitarianism. So, uh, first of all, we, we need to understand that it's what some people call a normative theory. That is, uh, it's a, th a theory which is action guiding, it's giving us norms about how we should act. And the two components are really these. One is a conception of, well, utility or well-being or welfare, what it is that makes life good for people. And the second is a maximizing principle, which says that we should, in our actions, produce as much of that as possible. So there are obviously different forms of utilitarianism available depending on um, what the proponent thinks makes life good for people and what kind of maximizing principle they have in mind. But those, I think, would be the two main components of any utilitarian theory. And one other thing worth pointing out is that utilitarians think those are really the only things that matter, utility right. and producing it. So that's why I think, um, that's where I think most of the objections to utilitarianism come from, because people might say, well, you know, I quite like the idea of, you know, utility or happiness. Yes, I think there should be more of it. But I also care about justice, rights, virtue, lots of other things which utilitarians tend to forget about. So let's... Let's circle, let's put a flag in that, and I think towards the end of the, the, the interview, we'll come back to this idea of utility and only utility. For now, though, let's just start at the beginning of the chain, which is Bentham. Because just as a slight prelude to this, I find most people have a slightly negative connotation in their head when they hear utilitarianism, where if they're philosophically trained, they tend to think, Something like what you just said, that this is excluding other things that we want to care about. But even in everyday parlance, if you say utilitarianism, it seems to evoke the functional over the beautiful. If you talk about utilitarian architecture, it, it, one imagines ugly, drab, concrete buildings, right? And yeah. like I said, I'm, I'm sort of asking readers to maybe put that to one side for this. Um, but when people are imagining utilitarianism, at least those of you know who maybe haven't read every single utilitarian philosopher, they tend to be imagining Benthamite utilitarianism, which is sort of its original and one might say most reductive form. So who is who is Bentham, and in short, what account does he give us of what utility is and why it's important? Well, I think there's a link between. Uh, what you described as the functional um, connotations that utilitarianism has and uh, Bentham himself, because he was very concerned with making things more useful than they currently are. In particular, of course, the, the legal system. Right. But he was really concerned with anything at all that could make people uh, happier than they they now are. 
On the name utilitarianism, I agree, it was a bit unfortunate because uh, it's not really as if utilitarians want to make things useful for their own sake or functional for their own sake. You know, the, the things that they're talking about are instrumental to something which is good in itself, which would be um, human happiness, which people are not so uh, ready to sneer at. So I think something like Henry Sidgwick's slightly longer phrase, universal benevolence, is a slightly better and more inf informative uh, name than utilitarianism. But I think we are stuck with it. Um, Bentham was uh, uh, a polymath, a brilliant polymath. Uh, in the 18th uh, to 19th centuries. Um, he, he was slightly eccentric. Uh, he spent most of his time speaking or writing. He, uh, when he wasn't writing himself, he had an amanuensis who would write for him. So the manuscripts consist of lots of little bits of paper uh, written by Bentham or the amanuensis on all sorts of topics from politics to law to aesthetics to economics to history. Uh, he was a remarkable figure, but I think partly because he was so eccentric uh, and didn't really operate within any sort of normal academic environment. To, to that extent, he gave, the, he gave the theory something of a, of a bad uh, name. But it wasn't just that. He was also quite combative in his writings. So he he certainly wanted to promote utilitarianism, uh, but he also wanted to knock down the opposition. And he developed a theory of language, which I'm sure he was developing for its own sake. Uh, but he developed a theory of language according to which non-utilitarian theories were nonsense. They made no sense at all. So he didn't even think that... Uh, opposition to utilitarianism could be coherently stated, which is not a good way to make yourself popular with those who think those who think you might have got something wrong. If nothing else, it's just not strategic, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, this is not as someone who's worked in politics for a little bit, this is this is not necessarily the best way to talk to win converts, right? No. He's one of these guys, you see them a bit through history, right, who are obviously brilliant, but then maybe because of their brilliance, quite detached from, like, normal people and social conventions. Or am I, is that unfair to the guy? No, no, I think it's fair. And he, he was also wealthy enough uh, not, not, not really to have to count out to anybody. I mean, he, he, he had a living uh, and, and essentially had a lifetime uh, research fellowship, so he could he could do what he wanted, he could say what he wanted, he could live pretty much however he wanted. So, I think when most people think of utilitarianism, what they're thinking about is Benthamite utilitarianism, and in some ways that's that's understandable because it's still in some ways some shadow of it is preserved in things like economics and rational choice theory and so on, right, and. Well, I mean, I was going to ask you, but I'll just give the summary. It's a very, it's a very basic theory, actually. It's like the good is happiness, the bad is suffering. Both of these can be mapped onto and measured on a single scale, essentially. We want more of this rather than less of this, and we should act so as always to get more happiness and always to get less suffering. And any other concern can essentially be reduced to happiness or suffering or isn't important. Did I oversimplify? Cause, or is uh, I would say only very slightly, and I'm sure Bentham himself would have said w uh, what you said was absolutely fine. Uh, I think the slightly misleading thing is uh, the claim that pleasure and pain are measured on a single scale. Okay. Though, though I mean, Bentham himself would have said that they, they are, but it's... Uh, it's a bit different with pleasure and pain than, for example, with uh, a measurement scale. So in a measurement scale, you start at zero and you go up. So you might go up by centimetres. Right. Uh, and it's clearly a cardinal scale. Each unit is the same as, as any other unit and so on. But pleasure and pain are two different sensations. So you can't really have a single scale until you plot the value of a certain amount of pleasure against the value of a certain amount of Pain. So there is a certain judgment there to get the whole thing 
uh, the whole thing going. It's not as really as if you've got units of the same thing the whole way along. But but Bentham, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It's a while since I read the guy, but Bentham seemed to think there was right. Like he had he 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 really thought it was just you could map this down to a single unit, and then obviously later utilitarianism later utilitarians disagreed with him probably correctly so but he really did think it was just you you really could just start adding this up like calculus right yeah no i think that's right but he he sort of he didn't emphasize the fact that you had to make a judgment about how much pleasure was counterbalanced by uh, how much pain to give you zero right i mean you you you, you might be able to come up with uh, units of pleasure, for example, by using some very clever neuro neuroscientific device which measured the firing of certain circuits in the brain, that would be measuring pleasure. Measuring pain would be doing something else. Uh, and you'd need to, to plot your pleasure against your pain. So that's why it's, a, in a way, I think a bit misleading. Um, as the Oxford philosopher David Ross pointed out, it's a bit misleading to say that utilitarianism is a monistic theory, that is a theory with just one principle, because in a way, it's got two principles, maximize pleasure and minimize pain. And you could That's presumably think of all sorts of scenarios in which there is a trade-off between those two things, right? Exactly. And, that, and then you do get your single principle, which is maximize the balance of pleasure over pain. Okay, we'll take that distinction in mind. But even with that said, even just introspectively, it becomes pr clear pretty fast that even with two as opposed to one, this is still not how human beings feel about what they're feeling most of the time, right? And yeah. you've got, I wanted to invite you, if, if you've got a, a, another one you'd rather do, but there's all sorts of thought experiments. You have an example in your book of, um, I might mispronounce the name, but Hayden and the Oyster, which really sort of, I think, is a clear, intuitive exposition of the idea that if you just do something for long enough, it's as good as anything else. Um, do you want to talk us through that real quick? Yeah, so this is uh, an example. It's a, a rather uh, peculiar uh, philosophical example. You have to imagine that you're uh, a soul, Mm -hmm. and you haven't yet lived, you're about to, to live a life on earth and you're queuing up with all the other souls and the angel in charge of dishing out the lives says, well, I'm afraid we've got only two left. We've got the life of uh, a composer called Joseph Haydn and he will compose some wonderful music. He'll be very popular in his own lifetime. He'll be celebrated in his own lifetime and he'll have friends, he'll have hobbies generally rather enjoyable kind of life but then of course he'll, he'll die um, then we have uh, the life of an oyster which will be pleasant but the pleasure will be very faint not very intense and uh, there won't be any pain it'll be a bit like being very drunk in a in a warm bath and you say well i'll have um i'll have Haydn, please and the angel Look, I've been trying to get rid of this um, oyster life for ages, so I'm going to make you a special offer. I'll make it as long as you like. You, it could be a million years long. I think many people would say, I don't really care how long you make it. I'm going to have the life of Haydn because that's better. The quality of the pleasures in that life uh, makes it higher than, than the life of the oyster, however long we make the life of the oyster. So in other words, it's not just the... Um, the the uh, the mere quantity of pleasure it's its quality it's where it comes from right and so mill so introducing our next philosopher down the line bentham is the originator mill is he knows Bentham, that he's sort of a family acquaintance but he goes on and certainly as he matures as a writer um, develops an account of utilitarianism that retains the sort of core impetus of Bentham, but uh, nuances it, might we say, or, or, or develops it so as to get beyond some of these, these objections like the one you just gave. And what he does is he essentially says, 
there are category differences in pleasure. So, like, there's some things that are going on in Hayden's life that are so valuable that really any amount of the, what he would call, lower pleasures of the oyster, really an in, even an infinite amount of them, don't amount to the goodness of these higher pleasures. Let me just turn that back to you if I got that right and anything you'd want to add to it. Yeah, I think th that's a, a very good summary. I think Mill was really taking ideas from uh, the ancient philosophy of, of Plato and uh, Aristotle here. So towards the end of Plato's Republic, he addresses the question whether the pleasures in the philosophical life are better than the uh, the pleasures in the non-philosophical life, and unsurprisingly, he concludes uh, that they are. He also, Plato also uses the idea that uh, if you, if you, you know, if you want to ask somebody about it, you should ask a philosopher because the philosopher knows what it's like to experience philosophical pleasures, and they know what it's like to experience the 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 lower um, animal pleasures as well. And Mill really takes that idea and. Uh, tries to make it a bit more precise, and I think there are really two aspects to his higher, uh, his higher lower distinction. One is that he begins by sort of broadly characterising the types of pleasures that fall into either category. So, the higher pleasures will be, for example, um, aesthetic pleasures like reading poetry or uh, listening to some great piece of music, or moral pleasures or intellectual pleasures more generally, the mental pleasures, you might say. And then on the other side, you have the bodily pleasures, the, the pleasures of you know, eating, drinking, sex, that kind of thing, the kinds of things that animals do, the physical pleasures. So you've got, as it were, the higher human pleasures and the lower animal pleasures. Now, that seems to be absolutely fine. And Mill also says that even if you think there's no a theoretical distinction between the two, so you like Bentham and you're just thinking there's a single unit of pleasure, uh, the, the, the mental activities will give you more of that. Right? So uh, an evening spent in the library reading Hegel will actually end up being more pleasant than uh, an evening down the pub with your friends because you won't have a hangover the next day. But he also thought that... Uh, these higher pleasures are such that once they're in place, they can't be counterbalanced by any amount of the, the lower pleasures, which really completely blocks the, the objection that utilitarianism is the philosophy of swine. Because it doesn't matter how many pig pleasures you have, they won't counterbalance the pleasures of Socrates. Right. So here's, here's my opinion on this is, this introducing of you've got your higher pleasures and you've got your lower pleasures, it gets utilitarianism off the hook, as it were, with a lot of the most common charges against it. But I also feel like it's just something we should want to say anyway as regards to what is intuitively true and what we just know about how we experience the world. So let me give, this is slightly different to Mill's account, I'm just talking about how I see it, and then I want to get you to say if you think I'm barking up the wrong tree or not. But the way I see it is we know we experience things. It's, I mean, pretty much like I think, therefore I am, right? We know we have conscious experiences of the world. And moving a little bit on from Descartes, we know that they're different in kind and nature and in desirability, essentially, if we can use a normative word like that. And then we also know or not know, but it seems obvious just thinking about the things that I like experiencing, the things that I don't like experiencing, that it's going to be really hard to get any clear metric between the two. I think in Bentham's head, you know, Pushkin equals 12 units of poetry, or, you know, X units of poetry, or whatever it is, and there's just a sliding scale. Whereas... You know, if you were to say what's better, a great chess game or the best sex you've ever had in your life, you, you, you laugh because it's a silly question, right? And it's a silly question because there isn't an immediately obvious unit of exchange between knight to king four and sex. Like, there's just not a... These are quite distinct things. And there's not going to be a single measurement. 
there's maybe even, you know, it's maybe even more complex than Mill thinks. There's maybe multiple layers of these things, or there's just not obvious units of analysis between them, because that's just how these things are. And if that seems too complex, that's just how we think about anything else that we desire. So even something like medical health, there's no obvious unit between life expectancy and not throwing up. You'd, you'd be buggered to put a number on it, right? But both are obviously desirable, and we obviously desire more of them rather than less. It's just that it doesn't reduce down to a single or even a couple of measurements. And surely utility, well-being, flourishing, whatever you want to call it, is a bit like that. It's a cluster of different values that don't map down to a single thing and don't always admit of easy trade-offs between them. Am I, that's sort of actually Toby Buckle's personal ethical philosophy 101. Does that make sense to you and sort of fit within this sort of schema we're mapping out? Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. One thing I would say to start with is that um, the, the criticism to which Mill is responding, which was made by people like Carlyle and had been around for thousands of years, that uh, this kind of view is the philosophy of swine, as Carlyle put it, is it's an objection to Mill's conception of happiness, right? It may not be an objection to his utilitarianism. So one response that Mill can make when people like Carlyle come along and say that this is the philosophy of swine is they can say, look, just whatever your conception of happiness is, you know, yours Carlyle or yours Toby, just take that and attach it to the maximizing principle and produce as much of that as possible. Okay, so utilitarianism is kind of left standing by this. It's really a crit criticism of hedonism. Nevertheless, I think Mill sail sails very close to the wind with this higher lower distinction. And in fact, almost as soon as he'd published it, people were saying, hang on, you can't be a hedonist. You can't think that only pleasure matters if you're also going around saying that some pleasures are more valuable than others because you could only be a hedonist if you said they're more valuable because they're more pleasant and that takes you back to Bentham. But now, Mitt, in his um, autobiography was, was quite clear he never gave up on hedonism so I think interpreters of Mill who said that he was giving up on hedonism with the higher layer distinction are probably mistaken nor is it an incoherent view that he's giving us, giving us, but it is peculiar. What he's committed to is the idea that if an experience has something like nobility, which is one of the terms that he uses, that makes it more pleasant. In other words, the higher, the higher pleasures really are more pleasant, and they're made more pleasant by being, for example, noble or uh, moving or profound or whatever, but here's where he's sailing close to the wind. He has to say that you're uh, experiencing something profound, such as a work of art, does not in itself make your life better. And that's where I think you want to disagree. You, you want to say, look, uh, pleasure is one thing that's worth having in a life, uh, but, 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 but there are other goods as well. For example, the experience of great art or achieving something with your life or knowledge or having friendship. So... Let me, let me respond, not so much as like a defender of Mill, but just what I think about this, because, like I just said, I think the, the higher-lower distinction is clearly catching at something true, but it might, it might even actually be more complex than that still, right? So here's where I'm coming from, and I'm not coming from a, this as a place of I absolutely know this is true, just this is sort of where my intuition leads me, and if I'm getting it wrong, I want you to try and cash out exactly where I'm getting it wrong. But I'm not giving up on hedonism either, as, as the priest said to the chambermaid. I, my view would be, if you're saying, okay, some pleasures are just that much more valuable, and someone says, well, in virtue of what? Is making them more valuable. I would just say in virtue of nothing external, just our intuitive sense of, of, in our own heads, what we want and what we desire. And I think there is, 
When Mill talks about the competent judges, it's maybe overblowing it a little, but there is something to the idea of having deeply experienced both things. I value this one more than the other, and I would in fact not really trade it off for any amount of the other. It's just a statement of preference. And if someone says what makes that preference ultimately morally salient in some final objective ontological truth, well, nothing, right? We just have different sensations that we like or don't like, and we, we assume other people have the same, and you just map up from there. And so maybe a word even just like conscious experience captures it a bit better than saying utility. What you can experience and perceive and live through is what you can experience and perceive and live through. And there's, that's what we care about. And it's not obvious what outside of that we could care about. I'll pause there. I just put a little bit on the table. Okay. Well, I think one possibly useful distinction here is, is that between pleasures on the one hand and pleasure on the other. So you might be tempted to think that really when it comes to your own life being good for you, it must be pleasures that that count. So doing things that you enjoy, like reading books or uh, talking to friends, eating nice food or whatever it is. But notice they are not things that happen in your head. At least they don't happen entirely in your head. They happen in the world. They are real activities. The pleasure is what happens in your head. That's the sensation. So you can be a hedonist in a weak sense by saying, look, I think in the end, the only thing that can make you better off or happy, the only thing that's good for you is the pleasures in your life. But uh, that's not the same as saying the only thing that's good for you is this sensation pleasure that's happening in your, in your head. Now, if you, if you take the view that it's pleasures, there are all sorts of qualities there that could make those. It, there are all sorts of qualities there that could make those pleasures good for you. It's not just their being pleasant. And in fact, I think Aristotle is a hedonist on that weaker uh, construction of hedonism. So in terms of the weak or strong, I, f- I can't help shake the intuition that we're looking at something of a spectrum rather than a dichotomy with that distinction, right? In that, yes, obviously, talking with friends... Let's go beyond talking with friends occurring in the world. Let's, um, one of your things that you said you, you thought made life worth living was understanding or something like that comprehension, because comprehension necessarily maps to the world, right? And if you're understanding something, I think one of the the, the most valuable things anyone can experience in life is, and I'm going to sound like my friends who are like theoretical physicists or whatever, but really knowing why something is true in a way that really you know that it can't be shaken. And, you know, those of us who do the social sciences don't get to experience this much. But really understanding that moment Hobbes had where he he got the proof of the Pythagorean theorem and he was like, oh my God, this is incredible. You can't doubt the veracity of this. But that maps to the world in some way. And it wouldn't... The pleasure that you have on the subjective side of that experience wouldn't be possible without that bridge to the world. So it's only possible by consciousnesses being situated in the world, but you can still retain a faint hedonism of saying the thing that makes it valuable is your experience of it. I don't know, was I making sense through that? Yes, I mean, I think there are two, two versions of hedonism. So one version of hedonism says, All that matters is what goes on in your head and the way it feels from the inside. Whereas another version of hedonism says, well, it it does matter what goes on in your head, but what goes on in your head depends to some extent on the world. Okay, so if we put you in a machine, an experience machine, that makes you think that you're writing a great novel and you're absolutely loving doing this and all the adulation you get from winning the Pulitzer Prize and so on, Uh, The first kind of hedonist is going to say, uh, well, that's just as good as really writing a great novel in the world and winning the Pulitzer Prize. Whereas the second kind is going to say, well, no, the the pleasure of 
thinking you're writing a great novel is different from the pleasure of writing a great novel. So there is a way there through, um, as it were, philosophy of mind and how we describe mental states, how we how we uh, uh, individuate them, for hedonists to respond to some extent to uh, the objection that, that, that they would advocate plugging into an experience machine. So I'm just going to jump off the deep end here, and my intuition is telling me that what I'm about to say is wrong, but what if the experience machine was no different? What if it just felt intuitively different? Because we, we, we don't like the idea of an experience machine because we don't like the idea of waking up from one and realizing that our whole life was a lie, right? That sensation would certainly be undesirable. But we could be in an experience machine right now. This could be a simulation, right? And if you went your whole life not knowing that it was, and that was identical in some way to some other life. This is almost tautological, but if it's identical, it's identical, right? What, what, where, where's the traction in saying that one's more desirable than the other? Well, the, 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 the claim of the second kind of hedonist is that they're not identical, uh, because they, they are, in fact, different mental states. One is the pleasure of writing a, no a great novel, and the other is the pleasure of thinking you're writing a great novel. They are it, introspectively indistinguishable, but they are in fact different mental states. Now I agree that that is, it seems to me to be it's at odds really with the, the general um, motivation behind, behind hedonism, which is what really matters is how your life feels from the inside. Um, so hedonists, I think most of them would probably tend to agree that what you don't know can't hurt you. Um, but they don't have to agree with that. And there's also what you don't know, I think where the intuition comes from, is what you don't know might not be hurting you now, but might down the future. What if we unplug the, machine, the experience machine, right? We don't like being deceived because the, the reality of which we're not aware can always catch up with us. So this goes to another thing you say in your book, which is you talk about accomplishment mattering even accomplishment matters to um, an extent that goes beyond your subjective feeling so you would say your life was more valuable if you've accomplished something even if actually you went to your deathbed not being aware of that accomplishment did I did I track that view right yeah that seems to be a coherent view I have to say I've changed my mind a bit since the, okay let's hear it I find hedonism a bit more plausible, but that that yeah that would be the view of somebody who accepted that accomplishment was was valuable. But surely, in that case, I mean, I, I, well, tell tell me how you've changed your mind and why before I just keep going with my views. Uh, well, I think I've changed my mind because I've seen more plausibility in hedonism, and I saw a kind of analog between um, utilitarianism on the one hand and, and common sense morality and uh, hedonism and ordinary views of happiness on the other. So utilitarianism is quite a radical view in that it really chucks everything out of common sense morality except for the, the, maximizing, uh, the maximizing happiness principle. I, I guess I thought, well, maybe um, the utilitarians should be ready to do the same with their theory of happiness, you know, chuck out the the common sense views that what matters is, you know, accomplishment, knowledge and so on, and go for the radical view that only pleasure matters. Now, obviously, uh, the, the, the argument for hedonism there wouldn't be based on the kind of symmetry between um, those two theories. But, but when I started reflecting about it, it seemed to me quite a plausible, a plausible way to go for various reasons. I mean, for example, it seems to me a bit of a coincidence that most of the things people say are valuable in themselves, like accomplishment and friendship and understanding and so on, tend to be things that people really enjoy. I think there'll still be a lot of people thinking, well, okay, we've, you know, they've stuck with us this far, but there's still, what about justice? What about freedom? What about any of these big, you know, conceptual pillars that we build political philosophy on? Is it seems like, 
you're still in a point of view where you would do unjust things. You would, you would sacrifice the few to save the many. You would hang an innocent man to prevent a riot that would kill 10 people. The, you know, makes sense in terms of this sort of, let's use the word hedonism. I like hedonism. Um, and I think that's maybe going to be more intuitive than utilitarianism, but it still seems to be leading us to some profoundly immoral acts. And I think the other move Mill makes, which gets us out of, I think most of the arguments people have against this worldview is the move from act to rule. Um, perhaps you could talk us through that. Okay, well, I think um, you've identified really the source of many of the objections to utilitarianism, because as I said, utilitarianism in a sense is, is already within common sense morality. We all think that producing more happiness overall, other things being equal, is a, is a good thing to do. Maybe it's even required in certain cases. But what many of us also tend to think is that there's more to morality than just that. So morality is not just benevolence. It's also respect for rights. It might uh, include um, the promotion of equality or justice or fairness, desert and so on. And the objections to utilitarianism often consist in describing cases in which utilitarianism seems to ignore one of those values. So you describe the case in which the, uh, the sheriff has to frame an innocent person to prevent a riot because uh, if the riot takes place, um, that'll lead to to, to um, more uh, more unhappiness overall, and the way that utilitarians almost universally have responded to those objections is to say, "Oh, well, don't worry, because those notions that you're talking about, like justice and rights, they're jolly useful. So we want to keep them." Uh, and we want people to go around talking as if there really are things like justice and rights and, is, and as if equality and fairness really matter. It's just that they don't in the end. So you don't need to worry. You know, in a world governed by utilitarians, the police will not be going around framing innocent people because if we teach the police that they can do that, the results will be worse overall. Now, I, that seems to me in a way, uh, you know, it's a partial defense of utilitarianism, but... It's a bit of a cop out, really, because, you know, the, what we'll do is just describe our example in such a way that utilitarianism really does require uh, the person to kill an innocent person um, to, to, to produce the greatest good. Is that right or is it wrong? Well, according to utilitarianism, it's clearly right because utilitarianism gives no weight to rights. So, so. That's um, I, I want to offer a slightly different example of this, and then I want to, because, yes, you're right, when these, when these issues come up, this is the defence utilitarianism, utilitarians make, and then the response from non-utilitarians tends to be that you're just sort of reinflating the balloon, and if you're just going to say, well, utilitarianism leads us back to where we were anyway, then what was the point in it, right? So, just before I do, let me try and give maybe a more charitable account of rule utilitarianism or rule hedonism. I'm liking the hedonist word in this conversation. Is I think even if it weren't for meeting some of these difficult difficult ethical challenges, it is something you'd want to do anyway because it makes sense. So the philosopher Daniel Dennett, I believe, has an example of what he calls the Three Mile Island effect, where there's a nuclear meltdown. Obviously it's very bad for the environment, it's very bad for human health. But then he says, as a result of that, laws were passed that helped stop that thing happening in the future. And actually, the net utilitarian gain from this nuclear meltdown was probably positive. Was it therefore a good thing? Well, in retrospect, yes. But does that mean we go around triggering nuclear meltdowns? No. And I think what you have to face with utilitarianism is the huge degree of built-in uncertainty at every level. We know we find things more desirable, but exactly what and exactly how we describe it is really complex and is really difficult to make any traction in. And then how we act so as to maximise those things in the world, 
the world is an incredibly complicated place, and if you try and do empirical social science, you're dealing with literally tens of thousands of variables that interact in complicated and interesting and nuanced and intersecting in very unclear ways. And so if you're going to say, my starting point is we know we exist, we know we have experiences, and we know some of them are more valuable than others, but if we want to act so as to really get the most of those experiences, we're never going to get anywhere trying to calculate the, the consequences of any individual act. The best we can hope for is to rule some obvious things out. We know ritualistically torturing and killing every second-born child would, on the whole, lead to less happiness. I think we can make that assumption. We, we can start ruling out, I think, things like torture. I think we can start ruling out things like arbitrarily killing people. And even if, yes, there will be individual instances where it might maximize utility, your best bet is to just get some sort of framework for society where we say these are some minimum standards they are going to keep us away from the worst of it. And you might call that rights, you might call it rule utilitarianism, you might call it whatever. But I think it's a move you'd want to make anyway, because we just don't have the information about the world to, 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 to know in any individual instance what the, the, the maximizing course of action will be. I've talked for a bit, but just really quick, to the, to the, to the point people make about utilitarians are just going and if you say, well, you know, what about this case? What about that? We're just coming in and redefending it. No, I think trying to go from the ground up and grow from desirable experiences to the rules that will promote them will reinflate a lot of our current morality, but it won't reinflate all of it. So it will reinflate a lot of basic human rights. I think there's a good utilitarian defense against things like torture, for instance. It won't reinflate desert, I think. I think the idea that, you know, bad people deserve bad things and good people deserve good things, on closer inspection sort of collapses in a utilitarian worldview. And maybe it's a good thing that it collapses, but if it doesn't... I think actually utilitarianism is a great tool to go through and look at the rules that we have and say, can you get there from desirable experiences alone? And if you can't, what else are you adding to the mix? And why is it there? And how do you justify it? I've talked for a bit. I'd love your response and all of that. Okay. Well, you're not as pessimistic about uh, predicting the future as, as some people. So some people say we are completely clueless about the consequences of our actions. So some people will hook up uh, claims, for example, from chaos theory to say uh, it could be that my lifting up my pen, which I'm now doing, is just about the worst action that anybody's ever done because it'll bring about a million Holocaust equivalents a couple of centuries from now. So anything we do could have the most terrible consequences. It could have the most wonderful consequences. We haven't got a clue. I agree with you. That view doesn't look very plausible because we just kind of know that um, uh, lifting up a pen now um, is likely to have better consequences than my hitting you uh, over the head with a broken with a broken bottle. But I still think you were a bit too pessimistic because, um, I mean, you concentrated on on um, negative things, harming harming people. I think it's also pretty clear that helping certain people in certain ways is likely to make the world better. So if you, for example, if you consider a charity like Sight Savers, which rather uh, efficiently and effectively um, uh, enables many people to see who would not otherwise be able to see and prevents a huge amount of suffering. I just think it's a bit um, implausible that uh, giving money to sight savers isn't a worthwhile activity, so you might as well spend it on, you know, your uh, your CD. No, I collect. think I think that would map up from the sort of considerations we're talking about. And no, I mean, look, I've spent most of the last ten years working in nonprofit development, so I I, I ought to believe that, right? <laughs> I, I go for the negative cases. I think they're the most clear. I'll put it that way. I think anyone who doubts that actions have consequences. 
and really wants to go down the Jurassic Park chaos theory road, is invited to put their hand on a hot stove. Like, <laughs> you know, like there's just a level of common sense we've got to bring in here, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yes, I mean, I'd, also, yeah. I'd also point out, I think, that this problem about predict, predicting the future, it is a big problem for utilitarians, of course. But because the utilitarian principle, the idea of universal benevolence, is a very sensible principle which all rational people should accept, it's a problem for everybody. We, we all think there's a case for making the world better. Or we should think that. Right. And this is the thing, is I think people level challenges against... I'm actually going to start using the word hedonism, because I think that has a different connotation in people's mind. But people level challenges against that, that any other theory of morality would be equally unable to meet. So, yes, we don't understand a lot about the world. We understand some things, but there's a, there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and the further forward you project, the greater that uncertainty gets. Sure, but that is that is a fact about epistemology that any theory will have to contend with, right? There's, there's no starting point that changes that. Does that make sense? I completely agree. And, um, I mean, I would mention, for example... Um, uh, centres like the um, Centre for Effective Altruism or the Global Priorities Institute or the Future of Humanity, it's, uh, Future of, uh, Humanity Institute, all of them happen to be here in Oxford. There are people doing a lot of work there to show that actually um, there's more, a lot more that can be done to make predictions about the way the future might go and the, the way that we might improve the world. Let me just, we, we, we're coming up on time, but I want to just get back to this idea of the, what I see as the ethical value of utilitarianism isn't taking a set of rules of justice, freedom, fairness, whatever we might say, and saying, okay, well, we agree that this is the rule. How do we use utilitarianism to get there? I would say the ethical value is looking at the rules we have and saying, will utilitarianism get us there? And if it won't, then you have an ethical problem. That's not to say we suddenly abandon the rule, but it is to say you, you've got a gap there and something has to fill it. And I'll give one quick example. And if this seems like a bizarre lateral move, I'm going to bring it back in in a minute. But prison reform in the US. The US has, I think, the most prisoners of anywhere in the world. Our prison conditions are awful. Violence, sexual assault are routinely part of it. And I think... The utilitarian logic would be that we need a big reduction in the number of inmates, both for their utility, but also, I think, for society's utility. I'm not convinced that taking someone who's committing a nonviolent crime like drug use or sex work or petty theft is best served by spending a few years in a very violent environment than being turned loose where they can't find work, right? So there's a clear utilitarian impetus, I think, to lower the number of people in prison. Now, that runs afoul of one of these general guiding deontological principles we have, which is desert, which is the idea that bad people deserve to have bad things happen to them. And when you talk to people about prison reform, what you'll get back is not an argument that we need this number of people in prison in order to keep other people safe, a utilitarian argument, because I think it's obvious that we don't. Like a lot of countries in Europe and so on have much lower prison populations and are able to keep their crime rates under control, right? What you'll get is no bad people need to suffer. And there's, there's a gap between that deontological assertion and what utilitarianism will cash out. And I actually think you've just got to collapse the gap and go, you're, you're feeling that bad people need to suffer, or the converse, actually, that good people need to be rewarded, and that we can justify all sorts of levels of wealth inequality by, like, you get what you deserve. This idea of desert is actually just, just justifying mountains of society-destroying garbage. And if it won't cash out in utilitarian terms, maybe it's actually just because it won't cash out. And I think that's actually the value of this way of thinking, that it lets you tackle some things you assume to be true morally from first principles and actually ask, really, does this hold up? And I, I, I'll, put, I'll put that. Yeah, well, I mean, amen to, to, to all of that. 
Um, I think, yeah, most of the people who believe in desert and retribution also will put some weight on the consequences of of what we do. Um, yeah, they they they're not like um, uh, some people say Immanuel Kant was. You know, some they're not they they're not people who think that we should punish the guilty, whatever the cost in human happiness in the future. Uh, so then the door is open for an argument that even if desert matters, as you say, the costs of uh, the penal systems that we now have uh, in the developed world really counterbalance uh, that the value of any such um, retribution, and especially given um, uh, arguments about the lack of uh, equal opportunity that people have to avoid committing crimes. Yeah. Okay, let's, I feel like we covered quite a lot of quite meaty stuff. Let's wrap it up there. Let's leave it there. Before we go, though, I want to ask you um, if anyone has been interested by this conversation. Um, I've been working from your book, The Roulette Philosophy Guidebook to Mill and Utilitarianism, and I'll link to that in the web page when I put it up. Are there any other resources you think people should look at? Something on the more introductory level? Well, obviously, in particular, I would recommend that people read works by Bentham and Mill. When it comes to Bentham, the book to look out for is his Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation. Now, I have to admit, some of that is a little bit long-winded, but the earlier chapters are really excellent and, and well worth reading. Mill's Utilitarianism is a, is a shorter book, and to be honest, it's one of the great works of philosophy. So those are the places I think I would recommend starting. Well, I'll link to that as well. Professor, thank you so much for coming on. That's a pleasure, Toby. Good to talk. Thank you for listening to the Political Philosophy Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, the best way that you can support it is by helping us grow our audience. And there's two ways you can do that. You can share this episode or any episode that you particularly enjoyed on your social media. The other thing you can do is if you have friends or contacts who are interested in philosophy or studying philosophy, um, tag them in it or just forward it to them. So if you know someone who you think this conversation would be useful for, send it along to them. And for the people who have done that already, um, thank you so much. It's really helped us grow and get off the ground. So thanks again for listening, and until next time.